All right, so today we're gonna to learn about reaction kinetics. And when we talk about reaction kinetics, reaction kinetics refers to, reaction kinetics over here refers to rates of reaction, okay? Rates of reaction. So over here, we're gonna be talking about the rates of chemical reactions and the factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. Okay, so reaction kinetics is a reference to the rates of reactions. Now, to understand how, to understand how reactions work, we use something known as collision theory, okay? And what collision theory says is, what collision theory says is that collisions between particles, collisions between particles, right, or between molecules, for example, right, between different types of particles result in, result in chemical reactions. That's a very basic idea of what collision theory says. Now, when we talk about rate of a reaction, we're talking about the frequency of collisions. We're talking about the frequency of collisions, and we're talking about the we're talking about effective collisions. And let's talk about the difference between the two. So, first of all, what do we mean by frequency of collisions? So, when we talk about frequency of collisions, the frequency of collisions refers to the number of collisions taking place number of collisions taking place per unit time per unit time right usually for the unit of time we use seconds okay but you can use minutes you can use hours depending on depending on how fast or slow the reaction is but the si unit for time is obviously seconds so we can say that the frequency of collisions is basically how many collisions are taking place between molecules or between particles per unit time or per second. So the idea here is let's say certain particles are colliding. Particles when they're colliding, right? They can collide with a lot of energy or very little energy. If they collide with enough energy to cause a chemical reaction, that is called an effective collision. So an effective collision can be described as a collision, a collision that results, that results in a chemical reaction that results in a chemical reaction, right? And when we have a chemical reaction, right, we can say that reactants will react to form products. Right, so this is called a useful, this can also be described as a useful collision. So there's a lot of collisions taking place. Some are higher energy collisions, some are lower, some particles have higher kinetic energy, some have lower kinetic energy, right? The more energy particles collide with, the more likely we have a reaction. If they collide with enough energy, if the collision results in a chemical reaction taking place, we call that an effective collision, okay? And it results in reactants being converted to form products. Now, when we talk about a rate of a reaction, okay? When we talk about the rate of a reaction, okay, the rate of a reaction refers to, reacts to the change in concentration, okay? It refers to the change in concentration okay, per unit time, change in concentration per unit time, okay, and usually, usually what we're talking about when we talk about change in concentration, usually we're referring to the, usually we're either referring to the formation of a product, okay, formation of product, for example, we can also be looking at, we can also be looking at the rate at which, we can also be looking at the rate at which a, a reactant is being consumed. Okay, a reactant is being consumed. Is being consumed. So for example here, we talk about a rate of a reaction, it, it refers to the change in concentration per unit time. We can refer to the formation of a product or a reactant, the change in concentration of a reactant per unit time, or we can talk about the change in concentration of a product that's being formed per unit time. So we can say that the rate can be described as, the rate over here can be described as the change in concentration, so that's divided by the amount of time taken, so the change in time. So let's look at an example. So for example, let's say, 
let's say that I say over here, right? So I have a question. And let's say that the question says, the question over here says that, that sodium carbonate, sodium carbonate and hydrochloric acid, okay, acid react to form to form obviously products and we'll we'll write down the equation for the products over here okay and it is found it is found that after 10 seconds okay it is found that after 10 seconds the concentration the concentration of sodium chloride or sodium chloride is one mole is one mole per dm cube and the question says find the rate of the reaction find the rate of the reaction so first over here let's write down the equation so we have sodium carbonate reacting with hydrochloric acid to form sodium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water right this is a neutralization between a carbonate and an acid to form salt carbon dioxide and water and if we balance this equation over here we have two of this and we have two moles of hcl over here now if we wanted to find the rate of this reaction if we wanted to find the rate of this reaction what we can say over here is what we can say over here is that the rate can be described as the change in concentration over time right so what's the rate it, what's the rate over here well initially we had zero right so we can say that the rate is the change in concentration divided by the change in time right and we can say that initially we take the final concentration and we take the initial concentration right the difference between the two and we divide by the time taken. So over here, that would be 10 seconds. Now the final concentration of HCl was one mole per dm cube. The initial was just zero. And obviously 10 seconds were taken. So we can say that the rate of the reaction is 0 0.1 moles per dm cube per second. Okay. But now this rate over here, this rate over here is the, the rate of formation of formation of NaCl okay so this over here can be described as a rate of formation of NaCl so the units for rate the units for rate are moles per dm cube so that's concentration per unit time so per second sometimes you can find the rate in per minute also you know and so on it can be per hour etc okay so it's concentration per unit time so those are the units for rate so this is a rate of formation of NaCl so in this question, you can just calculate this as the rate, but know that this rate that you've calculated is the rate of formation of NaCl. Now, alternatively, the rate can also be found by using a reactant. In this case, they had given us a product, so this would be your answer. But sometimes they might say, okay, what's the rate of, what's the rate of consumption? What's the rate of consumption of, of HCl, let's say? Well, again, we can say that the rate of consumption is the change in concentration divided by the change in time. Now, if every second, if every second 0.1 mole per dm cube of NaCl is forming, how much is being consumed per second of HCl? What's the change in concentration per second of HCl? Can I say that every second, the, the concentration of HCl is decreasing by 0.1 mole per dm cube, right? every second the concentration of HCl is decreasing by 1.1 mole per dm cube right since they react in a 1 is to 1 ratio or a 2 is to 2 ratio here so for every 0.1 mole of this formed 0.1 mole of this reacts can we agree on that over here okay but the rate over here the rate over here for HCl okay the rate is always reported as a positive value okay 
So now if you, if you, if you record the change in concentration per unit time for HCl, it'll be a negative change because obviously every second, the concentration of reactants are decreasing. So we say that the change in concentration per unit time is minus 0 0.1 moles per dm cube per second. So over here, we're going to say, okay, when we talk about rate of consumption of HCl, it's 0 0.1 mole per dm cube per second. Okay. We're, we're going to take the positive value, but over here, this is the rate of the rate of consumption. This is the rate of consumption or decrease consumption or decrease of HCl. So even though we're going to get a negative value, if you get a negative value, it means that the rate is still going to be the positive value, but it means that it's a rate of decrease or a rate of consumption since there's a negative change in concentration per unit time. So the rate will be reported as a positive value will always be reported as a positive value, but it could be a rate of formation of product or it could be the rate of consumption of a reactant. So in this question, they had given you data about sodium chloride, but they could also give you data about HCl. They could say our initial concentration itni thi, or final concentration obviously kam, final concentration obviously kam hogi. Reactant ke le final kam hogi, initial zyada hogi. So you'll get a negative rate. You get a negative change in concentration per unit time, but you'll report it as a positive value, but you're just gonna say that it's a rate of consumption. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you have something like, for example, if you have aqueous sodium carbonate, right? Sodium carbonate ki rate of consumption kya hogi? 0 0.05, right? For every one mole of this, two moles of this react. So per second, agar iske 0 0.1 mole ban rahe, 0 0.1 mole per dm cube ban rahe, iska malab iska 0 0.1 mole per dm cube consume ho rahe, for this 2 is to 2 ratio, but then sodium carbonate ka 0 0.05 mole per dm cube kam ho rahe. Does everyone get that? Okay. So for example, over here, you can also say, you can also say over here that the, the rate of consumption of the consumption of sodium carbonate, sodium carbonate over here will be, if it was aqueous, would be 0 0.05 mole per dm cube per second. Now, if you calculated it again, if the initial, what we know is for a reactant, the, for a reactant, right? the initial concentration is going to be higher than the final concentration. So if we do final minus initial, it'll be negative again for another reactant over here. So we know that if agar aapke paas 0.1 mole per dm cube NaCl form kar rahe per second, that means half as many moles per dm cube of sodium carbonate are being consumed. So if you calculate this, you're going to get negative 0 0.05 moles per dm cube per second. Right? But then again, you're going to report this as a positive value. So you're going to say over here, you're going to say over here that this is equal to 0 0.05 moles per dm cube per second. Okay. This is the, this is the rate of decrease, rate of decrease or consumption of, of sodium carbonate. All right. So, so the next thing we're going to look at over here, the next thing we're going to look at over here is factors affecting the rate of a reaction. Factors affecting the rate of a reaction. So what factors can affect the rate of a reaction? Does the concentration have an effect on the rate of a reaction? Right? What happens to the rate of a reaction if I increase the concentration? So the concentration of reactants, if it increases, then the rate of a reaction increases. Okay. Pressure affects the rate of a reaction, right? But only for what? Pressure only affects the rate of a reaction if what's reacting? Only for gases. Okay. Only for gases. And pressure can be thought of, pressure can be thought of in terms of the concentration of gases. Okay. So for example, if I have a gas, if I have a gas over here, okay, I have gas over here, right? If I increase the pressure, if I increase the pressure, what happens to the volume? If I increase the pressure, what happens to the volume that the gas occupies? Gases are compressible, so the volume decreases. And we know that the concentration is the number of moles per unit volume. So if the volume decreases, if I increase pressure, the volume decreases, what happens to the concentration? The number of moles remain the same. So if the volume decreases, the concentration increases. Okay. So if, if I increase pressure, if I increase pressure, 
again, we can say that the concentration of the gas is increasing. So therefore, the rate of the reaction is increasing. Okay. Temperature, right? Higher temperature means greater rate of reaction. Lower temperature means slower rate of reaction. Okay. And then for solids, what's another factor that affects the, constant, the, the rate of a reaction, specifically for solids? And the surface area of surface area of solids. Okay, this is for solids. Okay. That are reacting. If we have a greater surface area of solids, right, then obviously you'll have a faster reaction. So in other words, for example, like if I had a lump, if I had let's say a lump of a solid versus a powdered solid, what would react faster? The lump or the powdered solid? Same same amount. I have the same mass of both, same solid. Which one would react faster? The powdered solid would react faster because you have a great, greater surface area. And the last thing that affects the rate of a reaction is a catalyst. So the first thing we're going to look at is the effect of concentration. The effect of concentration and pressure on the rate of a reaction. Okay. So now let's say that I have a solution. Let's say that I have a solution over here. Okay. And I have reactants key certain concentration. And now let's say that I have another solution in which I have reactants. I have reactants over here, but I have a higher concentration. Same volume, but more moles over here, let's say. So here I have a certain concentration. Okay, and what I've done is I've simply increased the concentration. Okay, so here I have lower concentration, lower concentration, and here I have a higher concentration, right? Now, if I have the same reactants in both, where will I see a faster reaction take place? Where will I see a faster reaction take place? Where will there be a greater rate of formation of products? Right? The greater rate of formation, right? The change in concentration per unit time, the formation of products will be higher where we have a higher concentration. And the reason why is because there's more particles per unit volume, there's gonna be more collisions taking place per unit volume, right? So if we have a if we have if we increase the concentration, if we increase the concentration, right, we can say over here that the frequency of collisions increases, right? The frequency of collisions increases. And therefore we can say we have more effective collisions, more effective collisions per unit time. Since we simply have a greater number of collisions, let's say only 10% of collisions were successful. If we have a greater number of collisions, then 10% of that will be a greater number of effective collisions. So we can say therefore we have more effective collisions per unit time. So that over here is the same as saying that we have a that we have a greater frequency of we have a greater frequency of effective collisions greater frequency of effective collisions so we can say that the frequency of effective collisions increases okay this is the key term so if i say how does concentration affect how does concentration affect the rate if you increase the concentration we have greater frequency of collisions, so we have more effective collisions. Therefore, we can say frequency of effective collisions increases. And if the frequency of effective collisions is increasing, that means we have more effective collisions taking place per unit time, so therefore more chemical reactions are taking place per unit time. Hence, we have a higher rate of reaction. And it's the same for, it's the same for pressure. If we increase the pressure, if we increase the pressure for gases, right, for gases, right it's the same it's the same idea right if for example i have a gas over here okay i have a gas over here and what i've done is in the second case i have a greater pressure so i've exerted a greater pressure over here so what i can see over here is even if i had the same number of particles right we know that again the concentration is the number of moles per unit volume so here i have a lower pressure and here i have a higher pressure if I increase the pressure, if the pressure is greater over here on the right hand side, we can say that the volume is lower, volume is lower and therefore the concentration is greater. Then the number of moles are the same on both sides. So again, we can say that if we increase the pressure, right, since the molecules, the gas molecules are now occupying a smaller volume, they're more likely to collide. They're moving around randomly. So they may collide or they may not collide. But now that they're much closer to each other, right there's going to be more collisions taking place 
So we can say if we increase the pressure of gases, again the frequency of collisions, the frequency of collisions increases, right? Increases. So therefore, we're going to have the more effective collisions per unit time. So we can also say that the frequency of effective collisions increases. And again, that's the same as saying that the rate of the reaction is increasing. Collisions increases. Okay. So again, the frequency of effective collisions is increasing. It means that the rate is increasing. Frequency of effective collision increases means that there's more chemical reactions taking place. So again, the rate of reaction is increasing. So now we're going to look at something known as the Boltzmann distribution. Let's look at the Boltzmann distribution of molecular energies. The Boltzmann distribution. Distribution of molecular energies molecular energies and you're expected to be able to sketch this okay so we're just going to look at that right now again the first question that we have is do any particles have zero energy and we know that all particles always have a certain amount of energy even in a the solid they're always vibrating so we can say that no particles no particles have zero energy right here we're talking about kinetic energy so we can say that no particles ever have zero velocity so there's always the particles are always in constant motion right even in a solid they may seem like they're fixed in place place but they are vibrating in their positions so we can say that no particles have zero energy of or zero velocity okay the next idea that we have is that most particles most particles okay most particles have intermediate energy. Okay. Most particles have intermediate energy. So not too much energy, but not too little energy either. Okay. And the last idea that we have is very few particles, very few particles have a very high energy. Have a very high energy or very high energies. So very few particles have a very high or a very low energy. Okay. So most particles have intermediate energies. Now how do we, what's the Boltzmann distribution? So let's sketch the Boltzmann distribution over here. In the Boltzmann distribution, what you have is, you have the number of molecules, number of molecules on the y-axis that have a certain energy, that have a certain energy, Okay, and on the y-axis, on the y-axis, what we on the x-axis, sorry, what we have over here is, what we have over here is molecular energy or kinetic energy. So on the x-axis, we have molecular energy. Okay. Again, we know that no particles have zero energy. So if we have molecular energy on the x-axis, when we talk about zero energy, we have zero particles that have zero energy. We have zero particles that have zero energy. So this graph starts at the origin, okay? And very few particles have very, very low energy. So again, now as you read intermediate energy over here, right, as you reach intermediate energy over here, you have a very large number of particles that have intermediate energy. So this, is, this can be described as intermediate energy. So you have a very large number of particles that have intermediate energy. Very few particles have very low energy. A large number of particles have intermediate energy. And then again, we know that a very, very small number of particles, a very small number of particles have a very high energy. A very small number of particles have a very high energy. So again, on the x-axis, we have energy. So if you go to the very high energy range, you have very few particles that have a large, we have very high, high energy over here, okay? So for example, like, let's call this E1, right? The number of particles that have this amount of energy, the number of particles that have this amount of energy can be found on the y-axis. So this is the number of particles that have energy equal to E1, okay? And over here, this energy over here, okay? This energy over here, okay, is the... If you look at the number of particles that have this particular energy, that's the... that This is called the mode over here. 
Have you guys learned mean, median, mode? In in O level math, right? So the mode over here is basically saying that which energy has the greatest number of particles. In this particular energy, at this particular energy, you have the greatest number of particles, which is sort of an intermediate energy. Okay. So for example, at any energy greater than this, you have fewer particles. At any le energy lesser than this, you have fewer particles than you do at this particular energy. So this is the modal energy. Okay. This is the this is the again yes. Your constant energy. This is the energy that the most number of particles have. Okay. It's called the modal energy. Now let now the other idea over here that you should understand is that the total area under the curve, the total area under the curve, okay, the area under the curve, okay, area under the curve is equal to is equal to the total number of particles, the total number of particles, total number of particles. Now this graph over here, okay, this graph over here is described. This is called the Boltzmann distribution. This is called the Boltzmann distribution. Okay. Now, my question over here is, my question over here is that what would happen, what would happen if I increase the temperature to this graph over here? So again, if I let's say let's say let's say I replot this graph over here, okay. So again, on the y-axis, I have the number of molecules or the number of particles that have a certain amount of energy, okay. And on the x-axis over here, I have molecular energy. Molecular energy. Okay. And now, let's say that this is my Boltzmann distribution. This is my Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so I have the Boltzmann distribution over here. Now my question is, or my question over here is, first of all, so again, the first question that I have is, let's say that I have a particular energy over here. Okay, I have a particular energy over here. And I'm saying that all the molecules that have energy greater than this energy have enough energy to react. So this area over here, this area over here represents the number of molecules, the number of molecules that have enough energy to react. Have enough energy to react. Okay. So we can say that this energy over here is the activation energy. This energy over here is the activation energy. Any molecules that have greater energy than the activation energy will react. Any molecules that have lesser energy than the activation energy will not react. Okay, so we're going to call this the activation energy. Now, one thing to notice over here is that if I increase the activation energy, then I'll have fewer molecules that have enough energy to react. So again, the lower the activation energy, the greater the area, greater than the activation. So more molecules will react. The lower the activation energy, the faster the rate of reaction. The higher the activation energy, the slower the rate of reaction. Now the second idea here is that we're trying to look at the effect of temperature. We're trying to look at the effect of temperature over here on this distribution. Now what do you think would happen to this distribution if I increase the temperature? If I increase the temperature, what do you think will happen to this distribution? Will these molecules, will they move to the right or to the left? Remember, on the right we have greater energy, on the left we have lower energy. So what will happen to this what will happen to this distribution if I increase the temperature? It'll move to the right. The distribution will move to the right. So again, if I increase the temperature, right, if I increase the temperature over here, right, there will be more molecules that have higher energy. There will be more molecules that have higher energy. And we what we, what we also see over here is, what we also notice over here is that that the total area under the curve that's greater than the activation energy will have a larger area. So what we have over here is now the total area, the total area is going to be the number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So can we say over here that if let's say that this graph that I have is at a temperature T1 and here this graph that I have is let's say called the T2 and I say that T2 is greater than T1. So if I increase the temperature, 
If I increase the temperature, the distribution shifts to the right. The distribution shifts to the right over here. And now I have a greater number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So can I say that the, act the activation energy will obviously remain the same, but now I have more molecules that have a higher energy than the activation energy. So over here again, the graph that I've drawn over here is a temperature T2 that was higher than the initial temperature. So now I have a rate of reaction that's greater. So if I say, when we talk about the effect of temperature, if I increase the temperature, if I increase the temperature, I can say that an increasing, increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature results in what? Increasing the temperature results in, okay, the following effects. We can say that if I increase the temperature, now the particles have greater kinetic energy, have greater kinetic energy, right? Okay, on average, which means that, which means that the frequency of collisions as well as effective collisions, effective collisions increases, effective collisions increases. Now what that means is the frequency of elective collisions increases, it means that therefore the, therefore the rate of reaction increases. Rate of reaction increases. Okay. And we can say that, we can say that there are now more molecules, more particles or more molecules. There are more particles that have energy, that have energy, that have an energy greater than the activation energy. Again, the idea here is that at a lower temperature, the area under the curve greater than the activation energy is this area over here that I've highlighted, the lower highlighted area. At a higher temperature, the total area greater than the activation energy is this total energy over here, this total area. So we can say that the, the number of molecules that have enough energy to react is greater at a higher temperature. The total area is greater at a higher temperature above the activation energy. The area under the curve is greater at a higher temperature. So that means more reactions will be taking place per unit time. So you have a greater rate of reaction. Another thing to note is that the total area under the curve, the total area under both curves, is that the same or is that different? The total area under the curves is the same because we have the same total number of particles. We have the same total number of particles, but now there's more particles at a higher energy at a greater temperature and more particles at lower energies at a lower temperature. But the total area under the curve is the same for both T1 and T2. When you increase the temperature, right? Sometimes they'll also ask you the effect on the Boltzmann distribution or the curve itself. So what you can say over here is, what you can say over here is that as we increase the temperature, as we increase the temperature, the curve shifts to the right. The curve shifts to the right. Okay. The curve gets broader, gets broader and flatter and flatter since we have a greater spread of energies. We have a greater spread of energies. Pele, most of the particles were at this low energy, low, are relatively low energy. Now we have way more particles that have higher energy. So we've spread the, we've spread the values over here at a greater range. So we, we can say that the curve gets broader and flatter over here. And obviously the total area under the curve remains the same. Total area under the curve remains the same. remains the same, okay? So a question can ask, why does the rate of a reaction increase when you increase the temperature? Then you're gonna say, okay, the particles have greater kinetic energy. You have a greater frequency of effective collisions because more particles have energy greater than the activation energy and therefore the rate of the reaction increases. Therefore the rate of the reaction increases. On the other hand, the question may also ask, the question may also ask, 
explain what happens to the Boltzmann distribution or the curve itself when we increase the temperature. If the question asks what happens to the curve, you're going to say the curve shifts to the right where you have higher energies. It gets broader and flatter. Okay, so you have a smaller peak, but you have a broader and flatter curve. Okay, and the total area under the curve remains the same. Now the next question that we have here is that what would happen if I decrease the temperature? What would happen if I decrease the temperature? So what do you think happens if I decrease the temperature? What will happen to the curve then? Will it shift to the right or to the left? So if I decrease the temperature over here, if I decrease the temperature over here, the curve will shift to the left and it'll get even narrower and steeper. It'll get even narrower and steeper, okay? So over here, what's happening is that the curve will get even narrower and even steeper. And now you'll have, you'll have even fewer particles, you'll have even fewer particles that have enough energy to react. You'll have even fewer particles that have enough energy to react over here. So what we can say is that when we decrease the temperature, when we decrease the temperature over here, right? Right? What we can say is that the curve will shift to the left, will shift to the left, okay? it will get narrower and steeper. It will get narrower and steeper, okay? And obviously, we can also say that the total area will still remain the same. Total area under the curve will remain the same. Is the same. So over here, let's call this T3. We're saying that T3 over here is lesser than T1. This is a lower temperature, and if you had to and if you had to describe the effect that it has on the rate of the reaction, it'll be the exact opposite for increasing the temperature. For decreasing the temperature, you would say that particles have lesser kinetic an energy on average. Particles have lesser average kinetic energy, so therefore you have the frequency of effective collisions is decreasing because fewer particles would have an energy greater than the activation energy. Fewer particles will have an energy greater than the activation energy. So you would describe the exact opposite for decreasing the temperature here, okay? What you also see over here is if when we say that the curve shifts to the right at a higher temperature, it means that the modal value is higher on the right. The peak over here is over, uh, for the initial temperature, the, the peak was further to the left. At a higher temperature, the peak will be further to the right. And at a lower temperature, the peak will be further to the left and it will be taller. Higher temperature peak will be further to the right and it will be shorter. So now we're going to look at the effect of catalysts. Now, again, let's look at the Boltzmann distribution. Okay. Now, if we have the Boltzmann distribution over here, okay, and again, I have the number of particles that have a certain energy, okay, or the number of molecules on the y-axis. On the x-axis, I have molecular energy, okay? And let's say that I draw the distribution over here, okay? I draw the distribution over here. You should be able to sketch the distribution, okay? So when I draw the distribution, and let's say that over here, this is my this is my activation energy. So the area under the graph over here, this area, this area represents to the right of the activation energy, okay, is the total number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So this is the area, right? This, this area over here represents the number of molecules, number of molecules that have enough energy to react. Enough energy to react. Now, when I, when I use a catalyst, what is the catalyst effect? What does the catalyst do? If you guys remember, a catalyst will. So when we have a catalyst, right, it'll lower the activation energy. So with a catalyst, with a catalyst, we'll have a lower activation energy. So we'll say activation energy with a catalyst, okay? We'll say an activation energy with the catalyst. So if I use a catalyst over here, Right, the total area over here that I've highlighted with this with the lines over here. Okay, now this area represents 
the number of molecules the number of molecules that have that have enough energy to react enough energy to react so what does the catalyst do it lowers the activation energy so now now I have a greater number of molecules. I have a greater area under the curve that's greater than the activation energy. Since I have a lower activation energy, since I have a lower activation energy, right, I have a greater number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So if I have more molecules that can react per unit time, I have a greater rate of reaction. So that's how a catalyst increases the rate of reaction over here. So again, when I use a catalyst, when I use a catalyst, right, what does a catalyst do, right? When I use a catalyst, right, what we have is a catalyst lowers the activation energy. It lowers the activation energy. So therefore, what we have is we have a greater number of greater number of molecules, number of molecules that have energy, that have energy greater than the activation energy. Okay. If we lower the activation energy, can I say that the area under the curve greater than the new activation energy is greater than the area which was greater than the previous activation energy? If you look activation energy, dekhen, we just had this many molecules, previous activation energy. When we've lowered the activation energy, we have a greater area under the curve that's above the activation energy. So we have greater number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So more molecules will react per unit time. So therefore we have a greater rate of reaction so because we have a greater number of molecules that have a greater activation energy uh, have energy greater than the activation energy since we now have a lower activation energy hamare paas molecules thi jinki certain energies thi pehle jab activation energy high thi to bahut kam molecules thi jiske paas energy thi greater than that activation energy jab activation energy mazid kam kar li we lowered it now we have more molecules that have enough energy to react so therefore we can say over here that therefore frequency of frequency of effective collisions will increase when I use a catalyst. And effective collisions increasing means rate of reaction is increasing. Rate increases. So the, the lower the activation energy, the greater the number of molecules that have enough energy to react. So therefore a greater frequency of effective collisions and a greater rate of reaction. Now how do we define the term catalyst? How do we define the term catalyst over here? A catalyst can be defined as, a catalyst can be defined as the following. What is a catalyst, okay? A catalyst can be defined as a reagent that increases, okay, that increases the rate of a chemical reaction, the rate of a chemical reaction Okay, by by providing an by providing an alternative pathway, an alternative pathway. Okay, an alternative mechanism, an alternative mechanism for the reaction, for the reaction with lower with lower activation energy. Okay, that's how we define what we mean by a catalyst with lower activation energy. Okay, sometimes you'll see the word pathway used instead of mechanism. So you can say that a catalyst provides an alternative pathway or an alternative mechanism with lower activation energy and therefore the rate of the reaction increases. Okay. Now a catalyst can be described, it can be divided into two categories. Okay, it can be defined, it can be a homogeneous catalyst, homogeneous, okay, G-E-N-E-O-U-S, homogeneous catalyst, okay, or it can be a heterogeneous catalyst, heterogeneous catalyst, okay, a homogeneous catalyst, a homogeneous catalyst is a catalyst that is in the same phase, in the same phase as the reaction, 
okay? And a heterogeneous catalyst is, in a, is a catalyst in a different phase to the reaction. Catalyst in a different phase. Phase. To the reaction. You can say in the same phase or you can say in the same state as the reaction. Same phase or same state. Phase and state are interchangeable here. So you can say same phase or same state as the reaction. And for heterogeneous, the catalyst is in a different phase or a different state to the reaction mixture. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So the first example that we're gonna look at is sulfur dioxide. Now sulfur dioxide, when it reacts with oxygen, right? It can, it can get converted to sulfur trioxide. But this reaction doesn't really take place very readily. The reason why is because it has a very high activation energy. You need a catalyst for this reaction. So if you had to draw a reaction pathway, if you had to draw a reaction pathway for this reaction, this is what it would look like. It has a very high activation energy, so the reaction doesn't take place very readily. The reaction doesn't take place very readily. Okay? So you have SO2 and O2 over here, and you have SO3 over here, okay? Now, what if I used a catalyst? If you guys remember, we can use oxides of nitrogen as a catalyst. So for example, if I have NO2 as a catalyst, let's say, if I have an NO2 catalyst, right? First, SO2 will react with NO2 to form, to form what? It'll form SO3 and nitrogen monoxide. And then in the atmosphere, nitrogen monoxide reacts with oxygen to reform nitrogen dioxide. So we can clearly see that when we talk about catalysts over here, agar NO2 initially use orata, it'll get regenerated at the end of the reaction. So when we talk about catalysts, okay, they're reagents that increase the rate of a chemical reaction by providing an alternative path with lower activation energy, okay? And they remain, remain unchanged remain unchanged at the end of the reaction. At the end of the reaction. Okay? And if you look at this, if you look at this reaction here, if I'm using NO2 as a catalyst, now do I have a one-step reaction or a two-step reaction? For the overall reaction, if you combine equations one and two together, if you combine equations one and two together, I have a two-step reaction. And this reaction will have a lower activation energy this reaction will have a lower activation energy. So this is my activation energy. This is my activation energy with the catalyst. Okay, and this, the previous one was my activation energy without the catalyst, with no catalyst. Okay, so what we can see is that we have an alternative mechanism. We have an alternative mechanism. Now the reaction instead of happening in one step is happening in two steps. Okay, so it's a two-step reaction and has an alternative mechanism with lower activation energy. Therefore, the rate of the reaction increases and the catalyst is regenerated or it remains unchanged at the end of the reaction. Now, the next question that I have is, is this an example of a homogeneous catalyst or a heterogeneous catalyst? Is the catalyst in the same state as the reaction, reactants, or is it in a different state as the reactants? If you look at the reactants over here, these are your reactants. Right? The catalyst, is it in a different state or the same state? It's in the same state, okay? Now if you look at the overall reaction equation here, okay, again, the overall reaction equation is the exact same. It's the same reaction that's taking place, right? Here is overall reaction, here is overall reaction. And the catalyst is in the, the reactants over here are gases and the catalyst is also a gas. So this can be described as a this can be described as a homogeneous catalyst. This can be described as a homogeneous catalyst. So NO2, when nitrogen dioxide catalyzes the formation of sulfur, uh, sulfur trioxide from sulfur dioxide, okay, this is an example of a, this is an example of a homogeneous catalyst. And what we see over here is if you add these two equations up together, NO and NO cancel out and NO2 and NO2 also cancel out. So the overall reaction is the same, but now we have a two-step reaction with lower activation energy, so you have an alternative mechanisms, and the catalyst is regenerated or remains unchanged at the end of the reaction. 
So again, gaseous reactants, gaseous catalyst is in the same state. Okay. Now let's look at another example. Let's look at let's look at this example here. We know that if, for example, ethene, ethene reacts with hydrogen gas in the presence of nickel, in the presence of nickel catalyst over here, and heat to form to form ethane. Now, my question is this guy. Is this guy an example of a heterogeneous catalyst or a homogeneous catalyst? You have ethene gas and hydrogen gas reacting, and the catalyst is a metal. So is this a heterogeneous catalyst or a homogeneous catalyst? Nickel is an example of a heterogeneous catalyst because, it, because the catalyst is a solid, whereas the reactants and the products are all gases. So the catalyst has a different state or is in a different phase to the reaction. Hence, it can be described as a, as a heterogeneous catalyst. Okay. So if I ask you what, explain what is meant by a homogeneous catalyst. A homogeneous catalyst is a reagent that increases the rate of a chemical reaction by providing an alternative mechanism with lower activation energy and it is in the same phase as the reaction mixture. If I say what is meant by a heterogeneous catalyst, it is a reagent that increases the rate by providing an alternative mechanism with lower activation energy and it is in, the, it is in a different phase to the reaction mixture. Okay, and that wraps up this chapter on reaction kinetics. One last thing to note over here is that the activation energy, the activation energy can be described, the activation energy can be described as the minimum energy, the minimum energy needed, required for a collision to be effective. In other words, for a reaction to take place. Collision to be effective means for a reaction to take place.